Hi everyone, I'm Joey. We're going to be making this big built-in uh, wardrobe and this video is going to be a little bit different than what I usually do in that I'm going to stop along the way and kind of explain what I'm doing, why I'm doing it and some kind of tips and tricks along the way. So if you want to make something like this yourself, you could knowing some of the tips and tricks. Now granted, I have a full workshop of tools and machinery, but that's not really the point as long as you grasp some of the ideas that I'm talking about, um, all of the work can be done with smaller machines um, for, for a lot less of a budget than what I've outlaid with my machines. So, I'm saying that, let's get into it. So, once you've got your plans drawn up, you know what you're going to cut, it's time to start breaking down the uh, panels that you're going to use. In this case, I'm using a 16mm plywood with a high pressure laminate finish already on top of it. Okay, it's pretty hard to actually see this, but the HPL finish is short of the edge of the plywood by at least a mil and a half there. And that happens a lot with pre-finished panels, and that's why the panel is made oversize, so you can trim that off straight and true, and then carry on working with the panel. You should never assume that the the factory edge is correct. Okay, so this is a second one of these edge banders I've had. The first one lasted me seven years, and it costs about 700 New Zealand dollars. And compare that with the next kind of model up, which is um, something with a hot glue pot, uh, which glues the veneer, uh, glues the edging tape. Uh, they go for about four to five thousand, and so there's a massive jump in price. Uh, I've found these things work great and if I can get seven years out of it at a hundred dollars a year, fine with me. Okay, here's a carcass I happen to have sitting around in the workshop right now. To illustrate what I've done, uh, I always make sure I have my at least the bottom panel goes full width and the sides come down onto that. Uh, that way the weight is not just sitting on the three or four screws that are holding the unit together like you often see in flat pack uh, kitchen type things and presumably they do that because it's easier for them to have all their uh, shelves the same size so everything runs in between the sides that way their shelves are all cut the same size that they don't have to differentiate between the panels so people can put them together and not stuff it up um, it's not great because all the weight ends up just sagging down onto the three or four screws they provide and when it's in particle board at that that's no good so bottom panel full width. Generally the top panel is a full width. And then if you need to cut an extra shelf, then you just cut an extra shelf. When it comes to the back, I like to use the same product as the rest of the carcass, in this case 16mm plywood. Um, I used to cheap out a bit and use 6mm uh, backings, but it's just too floppy and you can't get any fixings through it into the wall. So that's what we've done generally. 
Now, in the case of the wardrobe I've been making, I've actually used a 10 mil panel because uh, I need to reduce the weight of these big, those big carcass units are, are massive and I have to carry them in somewhere. So I've uh, used a 10 mil panel and pinned it on with 30 mil pins uh, or staples uh, all the way around. So there's 20 mil of protrusion into the carcass with those pins. So that's perfectly fine. When in, a, in a unit which is just going to be shifted once onto site, screwed into place into the wall, uh, it's never going to go anywhere. So there's no harm in that. Right, you probably heard all that noise in the background and that is Nick here milling up all this pine for the door frames. Okay, this 6mm wide kerf grooving blade is a really cool thing uh, I've discovered. They come in, I think, 5, 6, 8 and 10mm wide. So it's a really good option when you need a set width and you don't need to bother fussing around with a dado stack. You can just grab the, the right blade that you need. Um, so I just have this one because typically I use 6mm panels for most of my doors. Because I use a 6mm panel most of the time, uh, and I have a 6mm blade, that can cause some interference and make it difficult to fit the door together. So I found the best thing is to mark as best you can the center of your panel, or the rail or style, uh, run it through the saw, you're going to have a 6mm groove, turn the panel round, or the rail around, run it through again, and you have to play with it a little bit, but what you'll get is a dead center groove that is slightly oversized, which means that the panel fits in much easier, R remembering that um, nominal panel thicknesses are nominal, so it can range, especially in plywood I've found, um, quite a bit, so you need a little bit of extra room just to assemble it um, to make life easier. Okay, I have a pretty sturdy router table, so cast iron. I've got a three horsepower uh, router, it's a Triton. Um, this is a really large router bit, and you really don't want to be spinning this uh, unless you can really slow down the router. The speed I'm running is even too high. This really is getting to the point of a spindle molder size, but it does just work. So it's a really big piece of steel to be spinning at any kind of high speed. Um, what I like about this is that I can just shim all these individual blades and cut whatever tenon length I like. So it's a pretty cool use for a bit which I never really use. Um, so at the moment we just have it set up for about six and a half, seven millimeter tenon which just fits into those grooves. It's important to make sure you glue the panel into the grooves fully. And it's plywood, it's not going to want to move and expand, so you don't have to worry about that. The plywood is actually going to brace or help brace the door from wanting to rack and sag. So make sure that's all fully glued up and it becomes one big panel. So based on the size of the doors that you want to make, you need to think about how stable that door is going to be. If I had gone all the way to the top of the single door that was 19 mil thick, chances of it staying flat, um, not so great. 
you really want to think about the layout of the doors, try and break them up until they're as small as possible. In this case, we still needed four large doors across the wardrobe, and they're 600, just under 600 wide and two meters tall. So they're close to a regular door size that you have in a house. Um, and that's at the stage where you really want to beef up the size of the railing styles. So that's why I've gone with uh, 29 mil thick. 29 mil is very specific thickness because Bloom, who make the hinges, make a hinge called a profile hinge, which is made for thick doors up to 30 millimeters. To be honest, 29 is a little wide for the adjustment capabilities of the door. I'd go even less. Um, but you also want to manage having the beefier timber to make the door more stable as well. So it's something to weigh up and it is possible to make thicker doors with hidden hinges. Um, you just need to know what you're looking for. So what you just saw me do is position the hinge mounts uh, on the carcass and I was using a story rod and really this is the only good way to transfer um, the, the hinge positions to the carcass when you're always making different size projects. So the story rod is exactly the same length as the door and I always put my hinges 100 millimeters in from the end of each door. That's where my drilling jig is set up for which you'll see soon. So all you have to do is position the story rod flush where they want the, either the top or the bottom of the door to be and take your mark across to the carcass. Really simple and really foolproof way to get the hinges in the right place. Once you've marked the hinge position, you can use a, a small jig. In this case, I've got a little jig from Bloom to mark where the drilling holes need to go. I like to use a hinge mount that has a five millimeter doweled um, plug on the back of it uh, and then I can just slide that into the hole and do the screws up and it jams it into place. For things like kitchens or built-ins like this wardrobe that are probably going to have high use I like to use these Han drawer runners. Um, it's a nice little kit set where all you have to do is make the bottom panel and the back panel and then you can choose different heights for side rails which I'll show you later on. It's really quick and effective and they're very strong and really I think quite nice for what they are, drawers. So once you have worked out where your drawer runner is going to sit, which I'll get to in a second, the best way I've found is to start from the top and work your way down and cut the packer, which is a piece of plywood I have here, to sit your drawer runner on, so it's sitting parallel to the bottom of your carcass, screw it on, and then you can cut that packer down to suit your next runner height. You can put your runners in a lot of different places, but you really want to make your life easier all around when you're installing this kind of hardware. So the best thing I've found is to actually mark on the edge of the carcass exactly where your draw fronts will be, where they will stop and start. Um, and so essentially you're marking where the two millimeter gap is between each of the draw fronts. Now the bottom draw front always has to hang down and cover the carcass at the bottom. In this case it's I think 16, 16 mil. So the best trick I've found is that you have the bottom of your draw front marked and come up 16 mil for each draw front, for each draw runner, not just the bottom one. That way when you're working out the placement for the bracket which attaches the draw front to the runners, it's the same distance for all of your draw fronts and you don't have to do the calculations for each one. Um, it also just gives you that extra bit of peace of mind kind of clearance that the draw runner is never going to smash into the top edge of your uh, the lower draw front 
which if you have to do some crazy adjustments, it can start getting really close. And so you would just want to give yourself an extra bit of breathing room there. Okay, the purpose of the scriber is to allow for the crooked walls in the house. Um, the width of the scriber needs to be at least as much as the walls are out of plumb. But also keep in mind that you can create a border with the size of the scriber. In this case, they're, they're about 5 to 10 mil too big. Uh, we'll scribe them down to match the wall on site. Um, but what it also does is it keeps the carcass away from the walls so you're not going to have any interference and the only part that is seen which is touching the walls is the scriber at the size and in this case the top where I have to scribe around some existing scotia and you have a toe kick which butts up to the existing skirting board and that's all pretty self-explanatory I think. So looking at the back of the scriber, this is the side of the carcass. Um, the scriber is being held in place by a screw from the inside into this block. Now of course, on the day when I install, there will be a wall here. And so when you're fitting the scriber in and out, um, it can be really frustrating when the scriber keeps falling down into the gap that's between the wall and the carcass. So my little tip that I do is I super glue a little block onto the carcass right there and then when the, I go to fit the uh, scriber, I have a positive stop as to how deep that is going and I know that I'm not going to lose the scriber in behind um, in the little gap between the wall and the carcass. So like I said, I also need a scriber along the top up to the ceiling. And it's just a piece of plywood. I've got a couple of battens screwed to the bottom edge of that. And they will lock in between the stop blocks I've screwed to the top of the carcass. And these scribers are the same height as the scotia and the few faux beams that are on the ceiling in this room. So they'll all have notches cut out of them and fitted around the ceiling and it should all tie in fairly well to the room. With the doors all glued up, it's time to prep them for paint. But before we do that, I need to drill the holes for the hinges. Now I've got this awesome little mini press from Bloom. It's a great tool. It does all the drill, all the hole drilling in, in one pass. Um, there's a bunch of different options for this. You can just use a hand drill. There's lots of little jigs available, so you don't need one of these things. It just makes life super easy. Okay, I'm priming the panels now with my little Graco Ultra earless sprayer. It's pretty good. I'll talk more about the paint process in a minute because there's a couple of complications. Alright, so I wouldn't typically pre-hang all my doors because it's a bit of a pain putting all the hinges on and taking them off again because uh, we're just still at prime. I've just primed them. Uh, but because there are so many doors that have to work together to form as even as possible gaps, um, it's a good idea to pre-hang all your doors. For a kitchen where there's just like one row of doors, typically under a bench, you can, you can adjust as you go, as long as you've cut the doors to the right size. When you've got multiple intersections, um, it only takes a fraction of out of squareness of one of the doors, which is highly possible, and in fact I ran into it a little bit with my doors. Uh, only takes a, a small fraction of outer squareness to stuff up all your your lines. So I've hung them all. I've got them to within a point where I can definitely adjust them on the day to where they need to be. Uh, I'm going to put the drawer fronts on now, make sure all they fit, um, and then I can get on to actually painting the actual colour. So using the manufacturer's information on the draw runners, it's pretty straightforward to work out where to put the brackets on the backs of the drawers.
The best thing with these kinds of drawers is that you have very fine and very positive adjustment. You can go up and down by about two millimeters and, and you can go left to right two millimeters. So you've got plenty of space to get everything just right. I had every intention of spraying these doors and it turns out, well, first of all, this is a standard, really standard white, it happens to be called alabaster, made by a resin and it's very popular here for the last forever, for the last five, six years. That's all anybody wants to use is alabaster white. It's very nice white. So I always keep a can of it around and we just go through the cans as we uh, go through jobs. Now, because of COVID, um, the raw materials are very, apparently, very hard to come by for resin to manufacture here in New Zealand and they've had to change up their formula because they've got different ingredients now which means they have actually said that the, the paint colors will not be the same and instead of me just running out when I need when I do and then buying a new can of paint um, I've got one can of paint I've got one can of paint that I can um, do this whole job with otherwise I have to will most likely have to respray everything with the new paint, which is slightly different. Which is a pain in the butt. So right now, my plan is to roll the backs of all the doors, and possibly a first coat on the front. And then, if I've got enough paint left, I'll do a final spray coat on the front. Otherwise, I'll end up rolling the fronts. Um, and I didn't even mention that typically when you spray, you use quite a lot more paint. So um, I'm going to roll, use, try and use as little paint as possible on the backs, and then use the can of paint I have uh, on the front, and then see how we go from there. So I don't have enough paint to spray the final coat, so here I am rolling it. It's actually not turning out too badly, so that is pretty good. So the last real thing to do is to fit the side rails to the drawer runners. What's cool about these is that you can screw them forward or backwards so you can actually tilt the front of the, the drawer front forward or back depending on what uh, is happening around it. So pretty, um, pretty cool system. So that's about it everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope somebody out there gets something out of it. and. Um, We'll see you on the next one.